Hey, everyone. It's Monday, and you know what that means. We start off our expert series of the week with Greg Dickerson. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. So, folks, if you like this discussion, you like what Greg and I are discussing here, please know that he has his own playlist on this channel, One Rental at a Time. Check it out. There must be 20 hours of us discussing various topics over the last year or so. So if you like these, which you will, do yourself a favor, subscribe to the channel, and please check out Greg's playlist. It is full of just tremendous value. Uh, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for giving me this time every week. Yeah, absolutely. Mondays with Michael. I look forward to it. <laughs> I, I love that Mondays with Michael. I think I got to get you a shirt that says that. <laughs> but you know what? Might need a hat. Yeah, I might need a hat. There you go. <laughs> what, uh, what I want to do today is we are about two weeks away from an important election. And we have two candidates. Um, we, one of them is going to win. And what I thought we would do is we would take a what if case scenario. You know, what if Trump wins? And we have to make some assumptions here. And most of that is about Congress's makeup. So in our first discussion, it will be Trump wins, Congress stays the same, right? Mitch has the Senate, Nancy has the House. And then we're going to talk about stimulus and taxes and infrastructure, healthcare, manufacturing, inflation, and housing. And then what we're going to say is after that's done, that'll probably be 20 minutes or so, we'll go in and do the same thing for Biden, except with a Biden win, we're going to assume a blue wave. Basically, the presidency is flipped and of some seats in the Senate flip minches out whoever takes over for the Democrats. Does that sound like an interesting exercise? We are going to talk politics. And, uh, you know, somebody once told me, you know, you can't talk politics, money or religion. I'm like, well, what else is there to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just for people watching, this isn't, you know, a view of what's better, what's not better, what's right, what's not right. It is hypothetical what happens if Trump stays in, Congress looks the same, what happens if Biden wins, you get a blue wave. I'm not sure there will be a blue wave if Biden wins, but let's just yeah, assume there is. We have we to assume something. That. Yeah. And again, yeah. you and I will do everything we can to stay political. We won't bring our biases in there, but you and I are business owners. You and I are, you know, we're risking millions of dollars. So I think it's a fair assumption to say what happens if this, what happens if that, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we're doing. So we're going to start with a Trump win. Uh, and again, the, the Senate stays the same. So first thing we need to talk about is, okay, November 4th or 5th, whatever it is, uh, Trump is the winner. The first thing we're going to talk about is stimulus, because I don't see any stimulus of any size getting done before the election. But post-November 3rd, assuming a Trump win, uh, what, what are your thoughts on the next significant stimulus yeah. deal? And I made a video about that the other day. And, you know, we need stimulus now. I mean, people need money. And there's things that they can do without doing the big thing that they're all fighting over how much state gets what, this, that, and the other. They can send money to people that need money. They can send money to small business that needs money. They can you know, rescue people that are in distress with mortgage. They can, they can help out other people other than just Wall Street. You know? So the excuses they're making on all this, they can, they can cut little sections out. And I'm talking about Congress. This isn't in the hands of the president. It's not in the hands of you know, uh, any one individual. It's Congress, you know, yes. Republicans and Democrats you know, getting together and working together like we all do every single day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh, so anyways, you know, that, that is something that is needed and that they need to get off, you know, get off the horse and start doing. The question is, are they really going, going to be able to do something before the election? Right now, it doesn't look like it other than maybe some stimulus checks going out, potentially. Yeah, I think the only thing that has a chance is not even stimulus checks. The only thing that has a chance is there's like 130 million or billion left in the PPP money. Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's going to be sent off as a standalone bill. Uh, I don't even know if that gets done. I, I think, I think frankly, um, nothing gets done before the election. And, and I guess I get it, right? You're, you're two weeks out from a key election. Politics, politics are trumping American pain, which is just so sad. Yeah, and that's where I, I'm just, I don't, I don't get it. Get, I don't get it. Get, the, get the, the support, the assistance to the people that need it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole play in politics and all that, there is no downside to, you know, sending people money that really need the money, you know? So I'm a conservative, but man, people need help, right? Yeah. We're in serious doo-doo here uh, from an economic standpoint. And mm -hmm. there's a lot at stake and we're coming into the holidays, you know, things like that. The good news is the election's only a few weeks away. So whoever wins, that's when, you know, the, the pedal hits the metal and, you know, the floodgates will open one way or the other. So, yeah. So let's talk stimulus. What do you think happens? It's November 4th. Trump's your president uh, for four more years. So, yep. So Trump is still in office. So um, I think that, you know, they're still going to wrestle over 
the main issues of the stimulus package are all the hidden things that they're not telling anybody, everybody about in terms of, you know, states and things like that. And there's some unintended consequences like, uh, you know, tax free airline travel. Mm -hmm. So they didn't think about that. Wait a minute. You know, there's private, you know, private jet cards you can buy tax free right now. So, you know, there's a lot of different loopholes and things that they didn't think about in these in these uh, CARES, CARES Act that they passed. So I think, um, you know, from the standpoint of the White House, you know, they want to get money in the right way to the right people, you know, uh, versus some of the, you know, Democrats just want to give everybody money in every state and just, you know, all this, all this crazy money. So I think there's going to be a lot of back and forth. There's still going to be a lot of infighting to get, you know, a divided um, legislature to agree on something that makes sense. Yeah, uh, but well, I think I, I think if Trump wins, he's going to hold the line harder than the Democrats. Yeah, I'll actually go this far. I believe if Trump wins November 4th, that um, I truly believe, and maybe it's more of a hope. I'm going to call it believe. I believe Congress gets off their ass and people have money by Christmas. That's, you know, that's yeah, I, seven, you know, eight weeks. I'm not so sure because it, it really is on the Democratic side where they're really holding up the ball, where, mm -hmm. you know, something could have got sent out, sent out there. And I know a lot of people may or may not agree with that, but it just is what it is. You know, they're, yep. they're packing it in with a bunch of this fluff versus getting the money where it needs to go. So, yeah, once the election's over, you know, there's no there's no downside at that point for, you know, Democrats to agree and, and play ball a little bit. And I'm not sure how the stance they're taking now is helping otherwise because people aren't stupid. People know they're holding it up. They know that it's in their hands to pass um, and that they could say, let's get money to people. So, you know, pe people will see right through this stuff. Yeah. One of the biggest things that you'll see, in my opinion, is is, is on the stimulus side. I think if, if and we'll talk about Biden next. So the, hold, hold your horses uh, if that's where you want to go. But that, that will that will happen. I think stimulus ends up in the average American's hands faster just because you don't have that lame duck session if Trump wins. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, you know, I'm going to believe that. All right. So um, what do you think about taxes next year? Right. There's one thing that the president, uh, either the current president or the president elect would be thinking about is what, where the tax changes are next year. What do, what do you see yeah. there? So if Trump is still in office, you know, I think he's going to con continue to be aggressive in terms of tax cuts mm -hmm. to spur economic development, because we are we're not out of the woods yet from an economic standpoint. We are mm -hmm. getting worse. There's there's serious pain in Q4. I made a video the other day about this being the most important quarter in our history of the country. Uh, potentially the history of the world, um, you know, because the United States, so many other countries, you know, are, are uh, you know, hinging on the United States, and we have such a big impact on other countries, our economy. Um, you know, I think uh, the only way to continue, well, I know, the only way to continue to spur economic recovery and growth is you got to cut taxes. That's where jobs are created. The more punitive the tax environment, the less opportunity is created because you're paying your money in taxes. You can't reinvest it, mm -hmm. you know, so that's just common economics, you know, common sense economics. So I think Trump will get more aggressive on tax cuts to incentivize job growth, entrepreneurship, business creation. Okay, very cool. I would agree with that. Uh, one of the other things I'm tracking uh, that I think of, because I think next in the next four years, we are going to have not only stimulus that we know the CARES Act and get money to people and unemployment and, and PPP and all of that, but what I have seen is the long talked about infrastructure stimulus, mm -hmm. meaning bridges, highways, you know, all of that stuff. I see a significant infrastructure bill coming regardless. But if, if it's a Trump White House, I see it very oriented to kind of the old world, if you will, meaning let's go redo our highways, bridges, trains, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, does that kind of do you see an infrastructure bill coming? If so, where do you see it kind of aimed? Yeah, I mean, that, that I, I, you know, I think there's some proposals on the table there. And I'm, I'm going to with you, you know, big infrastructure projects, roads, bridges, tunnels, things like that. You know, there's a big need for it. Um, the issues they're going to face is environmental opposition. Um, they're going to it's going to be a big political fight. Who gets the money? How are the contracts issued? What states get, you know, how much? Which projects are more important? So allocation of those funds is where the fight's going to be, you know. Yeah. So if you have Trump and you have, you know, a Congress that's, you know, balanced the way it is right now, they're all going to be fighting over who gets how much. So the question is, can they even get any, anything passed? Yeah. Again, I think if he's in in the White House for four more years, his second term, uh, you know, he's not a politician. He's going to, you know, push both sides to get something done. And again, I think, 
I think the way we get out of this um, malaise is with an infrastructure bill, which by the way, where, where I think an infrastructure bill is today is job creation. That's what it is mm -hmm. for me. You know, it's obviously good for the country and all of that, but it, for me, it's job creation and probably significant job creation. So that's where I see infrastructure going. Um, what about manufacturing? Uh, you know, what do you think about, and specifically here, I'm talking about bringing manufacturing home. Do you see that being anything interesting? Uh, I've talked about a proposal that J Japan's leadership did where they actually gave tax credits to companies to bring manufacturing back to Japan. I thought that was an interesting idea we could frankly copy. Um, it's just a bad idea, in my opinion, to have supply chains tied up in countries that frankly don't like us. Um, so that's what I'm thinking happens is, is some manufacturing come home. What do you think? Yeah, I think we need to figure out how to do that. I think the United States need to, needs to be more self-sufficient in manufacturing. Um, you know, manufacturing is becoming more technologically advanced. So it's a different manufacturing than it was, you know, years ago, but there's still a certain number of you know, straight up manpower that's needed in some of these factories. The problem with dealing with that and getting anything through or growing is or it's unions, you know? So unions have created an unfriendly environment for manufacturing to thrive. It's just too expensive. So that's why we're offshoring. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, that's why we're offshoring. So I think we have to figure out how do we balance that? How do we create an environment where you can, you know, manufacture something in this country and not get held hostage by a union and offer, you know, mm -hmm. good wages? You know, there's, I mean, Amazon's, you know, largely operating in this country. Walmart's operating in this country and they're increasing their, you know, there's a lot of people on both sides of the equation about Walmart, but there's some big American companies that are not unionized that are doing extremely well. The ones that are unionized, you know, look, look, look at where they're at. You know, the mm -hmm. automotive industry, no innovation. They're not, they're, you know, the big three, mm -hmm. we don't see electric cars like Tesla coming out of there, mm -hmm. you know? So um, there's a lot of things that that just kind of holds back in terms of innovation of the manufacturing environment and, you know, special interest promotion versus innovation, advancement and technology, you know, where it needs to be. Yeah. One area that I think manufacturing comes back uh, in a Trump administration is going to be what, what um, is all the health, you know, the, um, uh, medicine, right? Drugs and uh, what is it called? PPP, right? Personal mm -hmm. protection gear or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, Equipment, I think, PPE. Yeah, PPE, thank you. I knew there was another letter on the end of that. Like, yeah. Too many acronyms. <laughs> um, but that's something that I think- They both we, protect employees. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I think, I think we are, I think one of the things coming out of this crisis and we'll get through this eventually is going to be that can happen again, right? Ventilators mm -hmm. and just masks. The fact that we had to go to you know foreign countries that again may not like us to get masks for folks, uh, hospitals and, and whatnot, is um, something I hope we don't tolerate again. And I hope, with beyond all hope, that that is something that the you know if Trump was in in office, he goes okay, fix that. Even if they have to subsidize to your point, um, labor and cost, right? Because that I would call that national security. That's how mm -hmm. I would frame that. So I think there's there's some lessons to be learned in, in that. And uh, we just can't have that happen again. That's at least my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. We need to be more self-sufficient in the areas that it's really, really important. We need to be able to feed ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, power our own in our own, you know, e economy and environment, control our own health care and, and health and safety and not have to rely on any country because, yeah. you know, uh, they're, they're just wild cards. You just don't know what their real agenda is and, and what they're actually going to do when the chips start to fall. And mm -hmm. they're going to protect themselves first and sure. you know, rightfully so. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's, there's some huge populations out there, but um, yeah, I mean, the U S I think deglobalization is an issue that's on the table in a conversation now more so than ever. Um, and for, you know, for people that are listening, what, you know, what's deglobalization. So globalization is going, you know, uh, taking our goods and services throughout the world and exchanging in trade um, and creating a globalized economy versus a self-sufficient, uh, you know, national economy that's isolated, not isolated, but independent of the global environment. Right now we're not, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do rely on a lot of our goods and services to be purchased abroad in order to keep our economy afloat. The real question is, can we survive if we just lock the door and said, we're not doing any more trade with anybody else in the world? You know, can we still sustain? Mm. And, uh, you know, that that's a big economic question. And a lot of people are debating that right now. Yeah. All right. Next one we're going to talk about is inflation. One of the things that you and I, you know, as investors, especially in real estate that we see both in rents and property values and all of that is inflation. 
uh, if we have big stimulus bills, if we have big infrastructure, if we have a tax changes, you know, this, this economic engine of the United States could really get going. Uh, but one of the outputs often is inflation. So do you see inflation becoming a talking point or, you know, uh, a, a top of the top of the fold problem in the next four years, assuming Trump is the president? Yeah, so people are talking about it. So, um, you know, can it become a problem with all the stimulus spending, QE and all that that's happened right now? We're not seeing inflation at the retail consumer level. We're seeing it at the asset level. So it's already a problem at the asset level that at some point has to unwind. The Fed cannot mm -hmm. recap the entire market forever. Yes. The market cap, what's the, what's the market cap on, in the stock market right now? 30 trillion or something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just you just can't. We're at three trillion now in terms of a deficit. You can't recapitalize the entire stock market, you know. So you can't recapitalize the entire credit market. It just it, that's unsustainable. And what are the real effects of that? We don't know yet. And you know that has to unwind at some point. So those conversations are happening. So you're, you know, you're talking about when you all right. So when you talk about stimulus, okay, or you talk about infrastructure, you're almost talking about modern uh, monetary theory. From, from, an, from an economic theory. That's almost modern monetary mm -hmm. theory where you're putting money in the hands of the population. Correct. That's when you start to get inflation, real inflation at the consumer level, which mm -hmm. is healthy, a certain amount of it. And you want you kind of want to have that, but we haven't seen it since 08 and 09 because everything that's being done is not reaching the general population. And you know the other form of modern, modern monetary theory that I'm talking about was the bonus unemployment that was given to people. Yep. You see what that does. Direct payments to individuals de-incentivizes production. So if you're de-incentivizing production through that process, th then you know that that creates deflation. Mm. So you still can't have inflation. So you have to have you have to have a growing economy in order for inflation to be created. And right now you know, we're still in a recession headed for depression mm -hmm. based on the resurgence of coronavirus, businesses going, you know, closing on a, on a daily basis, businesses contracting that we're trying to open movie theaters, you know, the travel industry, the hospitality industry, airlines. I mean, we still have a lot of contraction. Now you see what's going on globally with the resurgence of coronavirus getting into the fall and winter. You know, this is October 2020. Um, it, that poses a real problem in terms of how do you even create inflation? You know, and I'm not sure infrastructure spending is going to do it because I'm not sure we even have the labor to be able to put people to work that will put money in the hands of people, which will then put, you know, spur economic activity. Think of, you know, oil boom towns. OK, mm -hmm. and that's what infrastructure spending can do to certain areas of the country, but it's only certain areas of the country. To spur inflation globally, you pretty much got to write some big checks to replace GDP that was lost through every small business in this country, every business that's closed, everybody who got laid off, you got to make them whole mm -hmm. in order to create any kind of real inflation at the consumer level. That's not going to happen under a Trump administration. All right. So if, uh, again, we'll just use 2%. That's what the Fed always talks about. So you don't see inflation uh, being reported or otherwise at the consumer level above 2% for the next four years if in a Trump. Neither level. does the Fed. Yeah. No, agree. Neither does the Fed. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, for all of those same reasons. I, again, I do think a, a big old because I again I could see you know four trillion being spent right both in kind of direct payments and then infrastructure combined for four trillion. But again, it, is that going to be enough to replace what is lost? Because like you and I've said it many times, Q four is going to be the most painful quarter of twenty twenty. It's going to be the most painful quarter since the Great Depression. And Here's the big differentiator. Okay, mm -hmm. the stimulus that we've done and received so far has been life support. Mm -hmm. That has not been stimulus, okay? Mm -hmm. That has been life support to keep the economy from exploding and collapsing. That's all that's done. It hasn't replaced or replenished or stimulated. So you have to have real stimulation in order to generate inflation. That's what the Fed doesn't know how to do and can't do, okay? Yeah. And let's put it in even, you know, even easier terms to understand. If you're a local restaurant or hair salon or you know, spa that went out of business or a movie theater, you're a local franchisee, you have 20 movie theaters and you're, you're bankrupt. You've been in business for, in your family for a hundred years in movie theaters. Now you're, yeah. you're closed, you're done. That's not going to get replaced. That income, that business, that opportunity. Now you're at a point in life where you have to start over. Now yeah. what do you do? You go get a job. Most of those people are going to go get a job. So you've removed a lot of enterprise 
and a lot of investment from the economy that could have otherwise been made. So what the Fed hasn't figured out how to do and doesn't really understand, how do you replace that? Mm. You know, that's the big problem. Stimulus to date is life support. It's not stimulus yeah. and it's not going to be. You can't, you can't replace that. You can't put them back in business yeah. and you can't make a bad business good. You can only keep it going for a while. Hence yeah. the zombie companies zombie, at the yeah. larger scale that, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about. Very cool. So the last topic for a Trump administration, again, we were going to go through the same list for a Biden blue wave here in a minute, is housing, specifically single family homes. Uh, I think it is very clear we are seeing urban flight today. We are seeing suburbia grow, work from home, all of those things. Do you see anything slowing down in the single family market if in a Trump administration? No, I think, you know, the continued lower interest rate environment is what's spurring demand for housing right now. So I think is, you know, that's going to be something that they'll be focused on, but you're still going to see tight lending requirements. Oh, you yeah. know, so um, under a Trump administration, you'll see tighter lending requirements. You'll see, um, you know, proper um, reserve requirements, down payments, you know, credit scores, things like that. But you're going to see low interest rates because that does spur, you know, economic development. It does spur home ownership. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's a good thing. For some people, it's not so much a good thing. But yeah, I think you'll see that continue to be um, red hot all the way through the end of the year. Very cool. All right. So now we're going to flip the script. We are going to have it be a Biden presidency and we're going to give him the Senate. Again, we don't have to make judgments on the likelihood of any of that. We just have to pick something. So that's what I'm picking. Uh, so again, we start with stimulus. Biden wins November 3rd or 4th, not a contested election. He also gets the Senate. Uh, he's inaugurated, what, the 21st of January, I think, 20th, something like mm -hmm. that. What, what do you see in a Biden administration with the full support of the Senate and uh, the House? Yep. So um, obviously, it'll be much easier to get things done from a Democratic standpoint. So stimulus, who knows what that'll look like? But, you know, whatever Nancy Pelosi is proposing and the Democrats are proposing, just look at their package and that gets passed. Uh, and then some. They'll probably increase it. Yeah. And, and then some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you'll see money going a lot of different directions, which, you know, again, could be good. It's putting money into the economy at the state, local level. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of state governments that are asking for money, um, you know, to replace mismanagement yeah. and, you know, bad practice. So, you know, states and federal governments will have a lot of money. So there'll be a lot of hiring. They'll be spending money on, on things. So mm -hmm. there'll be a little bit of stimulation there. But um, I think you'll see a big package get passed a whole lot easier. You know, in that you're going to have a lot of, so it's a social agenda. So you're seeing socialism come to light in the United States with a blue wave. That's where we're going to be. That will be the experiment. So you're going to see modern monetary theory. You're going to see direct payments to people. You're going to see a lot of money going out. Um, you're going to see... Um, uh, you know, in terms of a stimulus, you, you will see more direct payments, you will see states and, and, and um, those, those entities receiving money, you will see a lot of the causes that support Democrats being funded, you know, a lot of the nonprofits and a lot of, you know, different community organization type things. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be a really interesting experiment in socialism uh, for the first time in this country. Yeah, I think there's two things that happen with a Biden in a blue wave. First and foremost, the stimulus is much later than in a Trump win, in my opinion. I mm -hmm. think, again, Trump, I think you get it by Christmas on purpose. I think everybody would want it by then. Uh, but in a uh, Biden win, I see no I see no progress on anything during the lame duck sessions, what it's typically called. Yeah. So I don't see people getting any money until best case late February, just given the calendar and probably yeah. er early yeah, everything March. Everything has to flip over. Yeah, or early March. So that's, dude, that's a painful four months. You think we're in pain right now? Oh my God, right? Jesus. Well, but it'll be hopeful for people because the people that well, want to see- Hope doesn't pay the bills, man. Hope don't put food <laughs> in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's that's true. It's not gonna put checks in the bank and you know there will be big resistance that momentum change, but at least people will know it's gonna be coming. So also part of that stimulus package, again, you're gonna see rent controls, you're gonna see evictions on moratoriums, you're gonna see- um, more forbearance, you know, so you're going to see a lot of those things continue. Um, so, you know, a, a blue wave can, can have a meaningful impact on, you know, a lot of those things in the stimulus package. But yeah. The question is how soon can they get something through and, you know, what does that mean for people in the interim? And that's what I'm saying. 
Q4 in the first quarter of next year, it, you know, it's the road we're on right now. It's going to be ugly no matter how you slice it. I totally agree. The, the road we're on now is ugly regardless. Uh, but we we could, A, it'll be a double dip recession. Q4, Q1 will be shrinking quarters. So technically the definition of a recession. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say with stimulus before we move to the next topic is not only is it later, but I will admit it will be bigger. It will be mm -hmm. bigger in a Biden administration and probably substantially bigger in a Biden. Yeah. Administration. Yeah. In the blue wave. So it's not yeah. just Biden, but it's if you've got, if Correct. you've got a, you know, uh, a liberal government, a democratic, you know, led government on all sides, you know, that, that is, there is a, a socialist theme to that side of the government right now um, that a lot of countries already have. So, you know, we just haven't had that in this country and, and it's going to be an experiment in socialism. And I don't think a lot of people understand what that fully means because you got to pay for it. So, um, you know, and I'm all for some social uh, policies to help people that can't help themselves and to, to, you know, bridge the gap of income inequality that we have in this country. Cause that's a huge problem, mm -hmm. you know, between the have and the have nots. And it's largely an educational issue. Uh, and it's largely an opportunity issue mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed some way, somehow, because there's a lot of people that just don't have the advantages that, you know, people like us do right in, in our own country. And that's unfortunate and it's not right. And it needs to be addressed. And, um, so we'll see, you know, some some movement in those areas, which is great. But unfortunately, even even in a blue wave, there's going to be a lot of infighting over who gets what, where and how much. So it'll be interesting to see how quickly and easily things get passed. Yeah. All right. So let's switch to taxes. I think, uh, you know, in a Trump administration, we were talking about tax cuts and incentives to growth. You know, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the taxes will be treated very differently in a Biden slash blue wave. But what do you see there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And again, the big difference is low tax environment versus high tax environment to pay for social programs, to, to pay for stimulus, things like that. And just a flat out, um, uh, you know, uh, vengeance against corporations, you know, because mm -hmm. there is a belief there that, you know, wealth is bad, that, you know, people should only be able to earn so much, should only be able to keep so much mm -hmm. and, you know, should pay so much. So you're going to see a high tax environment you're going to see modern monetary theory, redistribution of wealth. People will get paid not to produce. Um, and that's just what that is. It's not good, bad, you know, right or wrong. I don't know if that's the right thing or not. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, we've already experimented that a little bit with the payment, you know, with the PPP program where people got 600 bucks a week to stay, stay home. Why go back to work, you know, um, when you're at that level? So we already know what that does. So we'll be heading towards that. But, you, you know, you're going to have to raise taxes to pay for all these programs. And the fundamental philosophy of that type of administration and that um, type of a, of a Congress is people should not make so much money. They should, they should be giving away most of their wealth to the people that don't have it and redistribute. So, uh, you know, that's just what's going to happen. And when that happens, when you tax, you know, big business and big corporations um, and you tax capital gains that haven't been realized yet, and that's a big one. In the tax plan is if you're like all you guys that are trading Robinhood right now that had all these big gains, if we have a blue wave, you better sell this year because those gains, whether you take them or not, are going to get taxed. And, you know, that's the type of stuff that's on the table. If you buy property and you've got equity in that property, they want to tax the equity. Oh, so geez. that's the type of stuff that you'll be facing are some pretty radical tax policies that, you know, we've never seen before that are very destructive from a, from a, production standpoint. It puts the power and the control in the hands of the government. Yeah. One of the things that I clearly see happening with tax changes, and again, this is assuming a Biden blue wave, is they're going to take out Trump's tax returns from the last couple of years. They're going to throw them up on a board and say, close every <laughs> loophole that he took. <laughs> Make those go away. Yeah. Uh, the fact that he paid They're going to gut it. And you know, the, the philosophy is it's only on rich people, 400,000 and above. That's the only people that are going to you know, have any kind of consequences, pay any kind of taxes. But the problem is when you start taxing business, you know, that's a small business owner, yeah, you know, potentially that's somebody who's employing a lot of people. When you start yeah. raising taxes to the point that, you know, it no longer makes sense to be in business, you have a lot of people that are just going to fold and it's going to continue to perpetuate the problem versus going the other way. Let the business owners keep they're, you know, as much of the profits as possible to expand and grow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you give the government the bulk of your profits in, in the form of tax, and there's no incentives from a tax standpoint to reinvest and grow, 
then what happens? You know, yeah. uh, the economy contracts. I think I think this is the tax system under either administration. I think it's going to be one of the largest deltas. Right? I think a lot of these things are kind of, you know, they're they're all they're they're just to use blue because we said blue ten times in a blue wave, right? Trump Trump's blue is darker, Democrats is lighter, whatever it is. But the tax structure, right? It's going to be night and day. It's going to be red and blue or whatever you want to call it. It's it's going to be. And here's the big thing to remember. Different. Here's the big thing to remember. In order to tax people, they have to be employed. They have to be producing. They have to be working. So the government, either way, hasn't figured out how do we put people back to work now, you know, with what's going on? And how are we going to put them back to work in the future? You know, infrastructure is not going to do it. That's not because a lot of people that just can't work in those trades mm -hmm. in the in the field, you know, working on bridges and this and that. There's just not enough jobs yeah. to create enough, enough tax revenue. So what's going to happen? They're going to realize, wait a minute, we have a large amount of people unemployed. We're paying them to stay unemployed. So we have to generate tax revenue. So it's going to come from the people that are producing. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, um, it, it'll be a very punitive tax environment that sounds like a good idea because people need help. And there are some gaps that need to be bridged. and There, there are reforms that need to be done. The, the problem is the unintended consequences. So I, I think it'll be very short lived. Yeah. Well, that could, brings us to the next topic again, going down the same list in the same order. It was infrastructure. I think one of the differences we're going to see in the infrastructure is, again, under Trump, it's kind of, he's just a builder, right? So it's going to be very kind of old school cement, bridges, steel, you know, all of that stuff. I think in a Biden administration with the blue wave, you're going to see, I don't know what, I guess they're calling it green stuff or mm -hmm. uh, all of that. I think that, I think the infrastructure spending may be of the same size, but it will be on different things, in my opinion. Well, green energy is a black hole, so it's very expensive, you know, and we do have, okay, so global warming is an issue. We do have environmental issues we need to tackle, wildfires, this, that, and the other, um, but, you, but, you know, throwing unlimited funding at ideas is not the way to solve these issues, um, you know, so I think that's where you'll see a lot of that Again, it's tax and spend. So you'll mm -hmm. see a lot of this, you know, programs that have to get paid for. It, by it's spend taxes. then tax. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, you know, those are very expensive things to try to tackle. And, you know, we saw in the Obama administration, you know, kind of a glimpse at that where a lot of these solar companies were given, you know, uh, uh, government backed loans that went bust, that went bust, you know, three, four hundred million dollars, you know, uh, to these different companies that, you know, ended up essentially a few people lining their own pockets and the company goes bust. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is something that will be a push and it is on their website. They say that, Hey, this new green deal, we're not, we're not backing it or whatever, but it's on their website. Yeah. And you know, there is going to be a green new deal. So I think they understand the roads and bridges. I think they, I think they'll attack that, but they're going to attack this too. Yeah. So, exactly. um, you know, it'll be interesting to see where that funding goes. And again, that's going to be the big fight, even in the democratic party, you know, who gets what, where, and when. Yeah. All right. Going on the manufacturing, do you see manufacturing being treated any different? And maybe it's a combination of manufacturing and taxes. Maybe one of the things that the Democratic with the blue wave talks about is, hey, if you bring manufacturing home, we'll give you a break. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but they could tie some of these things together, perhaps. So, you know, the question is unions. Okay. So in, in a blue wave, you're going to have um, probably legislation that's going to require unionization. Hmm. So you're going to see a, a national union, unionization wave. So the question is, what does that do to existing retail manufacturer, every business? If you're, mm. if you're now all of a sudden you have a business and you have to, you have to be a union, yeah. you know, and, and that gets pushed, however that happens. Um, what does that do to commerce? What does it do to manufacturing? And the only way they're going to stop you from offshoring at that point uh, because you're, you're just not going to be able to manufacture stuff when you're paying somebody 40 bucks an hour. You just can't do it. You know, it just does not work. Unfortunately, not every job can make 40 bucks an hour. You know, it just doesn't work because consumers won't pay the prices that need to be paid for that. Look at automobiles. The only reason mm -hmm. they're 70 grand is because of unions, you know, and it's because, you know, 50 to hundred dollar an hour workers. And, and you know, the, I'm not disparaging them. I'm just saying that's a lot of money, you know, for, for that job that is making it unsustainable at a point for vehicles, you know, and, and it'll reach a point where you just can't sell anything because it's too expensive. Um, so the question is, how do they stop a company from moving, which is probably what they might do. They might say, you're not leaving the country. You can't leave the country. Well, tap, well I don't know. I don't know how that, how that works, what that looks like, but I do know that there's going to be a movement towards unionization of all businesses mm. 
in that environment. Okay. All right. The next up is inflation. Uh, again, in the Trump administration, we basically said inflation is a not event for the next four years. Do you see it the same way uh, in a Biden blue wave kind of arena? Again, you know, inflation at the consumer level is going to be extremely difficult without putting a bunch of money in the hands of consumers. So if they do okay. that, yes, you can get some consumer inflation. If they have, if they find a way to get the money to to the people, you'll see inflation, especially if it's um, if it's in a redistribution thing. If people just all of a sudden get checks to boost their income because they're making less than somebody else, and that wealth is redistributed, um, then yes, you you could potentially see some inflation there because now people that don't have any money um, or don't make as much money all of a sudden now are being subsidized one way or the other, that can create some inflation. Okay. And then the last one is housing, specifically, again, single family homes. What do you think, uh, what do you think happens there? Yeah, so I think that policy regime is pro-home ownership Agreed. at any cost. So I think they're going to put, just like they did pre-2008-9, unqualified buyers into houses and mortgages that they otherwise should not be. People that are one refrigerator, you know, bad refrigerator from default um, into houses, you know, no money down, you know, very low interest rate loans, but they still have to pay taxes, insurance, maintenance, and all those things. Um, you know, so yeah, I think there will be a push towards home ownership, um, you know, in this country, which is a good thing for a lot of people, but there are some people that just, you know, should not be owning houses. Yeah. One of the things that I, I think housing, so under a Trump administration, I think housing will be very regional, right? There'll be some regions that win and some regions that lose, right? The whole K-shaped discussion we've had many times. I think in a Biden administration, there's far more all ships rise because I see, mm -hmm. I really see a tax incentive for first time buyers. You know, it was eight grand back during the collapse. It'd be 15 grand now. I do see, um, I do see the, the Fed kind of saying, okay, we are going to incent first-time home buyers, and we, the Fed, are going to buy down mortgages to 1.9 or 1.5 or shoot 0.9 percent. There mm -hmm. will be a push towards home ownership, like probably like we've never seen before, and um, you know that is going to feel good for a while. But that's how the balloon becomes unsustainable, and we're one recession away from huge problems. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what approach, uh, and I haven't looked at the plan, you know, that they have on the table for that, for home ownership in the Biden plan. I haven't looked at their whole, their whole platform. So, uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. You know, again, it's going to be an experiment in socialism with a blue wave um, yeah. versus, you know, pretty much continuing on the path that we've been on pre-COVID, you know, with the Trump administration. These are the conversations I like because again, we are about we are at an inflection point. You know, November third mm -hmm. is around the corner. There'll be there will be a winner, and you know we got to make investments for the next four years. So, Greg, I appreciate your time. Any kind of closing thoughts if we wrap this up? Yeah. So you know, I would say whichever side of the fence you're on, um, whatever you know policy, just be aware of what's going on. Make sure you understand the rules and the implications and the changes that may or may not be coming down the pike, so that you can position yourself in a way that you're protected, your investments are protected. So um, if you're in the stock market and gains and things like that, pay attention to the administrative changes and the rules coming down the pike. So if it's a blue wave, you wanna sell, take your capital gains off the table and be prepared for the future. Um, you know, if it's, if it's you know, uh, Trump administration and we continue on, your gains are not going to be attacked. Um, you know, so you just gotta understand the changes in the tax laws that, that could potentially be coming down the pike one way or the other, you know, uh, environmental regulations, uh, business regulation, things like that. So um, I'm not saying one's better than the other, good, bad. Otherwise, I'm just saying be They're aware, be different. prepared. Yep. Yeah. And just understand what you're going to need to do to move forward. Very cool. And the last thing I'll say is I voted. Make sure you get out <laughs> and vote. Uh, but, you know, this is, you know, people, a lot of people are talking about voting this election. Awesome. But realize that every year is important. A lot of elections happen at the local level that really change your local environment. So take your passion and energy for voting this year and make sure it carries forward into next year and the year after. So with that, Greg, I wanna thank you for your time and you have a wonderful week. Yep, you too. Thanks.